We are going through the book of Matthew. We're not going necessarily chronologically through it verse by verse, but what we're doing is picking some highlights out of the book of Matthew. And the last couple uh, messages have, have had the same common, common denominator in them. They were talking about things in the garden. And, uh, and I'm gonna be sharing a little in that same sort of denominator this morning, but maybe in a little bit different direction. So let's have a word of prayer and we're gonna dive into God's word, all right? Father, just ask that your, your word might be clear to us. It might illuminate pieces of our lives that, that need illumination by you. It might give clarity to things that we've wondered about. But more than that, we just ask, Lord, that you might just move us in the direction you would want us to go with our lives and in the choices we make. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's a lot of times you read stuff in the Bible, and, and particularly in the era that we live in, um, we read it and we just sort of drive by it. Oh, okay, well, that's, that's interesting, whatever that means. Sometimes there's terms in the Bible, we read them, and, and you can be a Christian who's read them over and over and over again, and you sort of have a general idea what it's driving about, but if you're really trying to define it, you maybe struggle a little bit. We're gonna look at something that's kind of like this, like this, and I wanna take you on a journey towards this this morning. So we're gonna start out with a journey starting 2,000 years ago, and it's in a, in a little backwater part of a backwater com- country that was ruled by the Romans, okay? Little town called Capernaum, and Capernaum, if you, if you read history uh, outside of Christian history or Jewish history, Capernaum doesn't really come up bubble up much. Not much was happening there. And in this little backwater village in an unremarkable area, there was a guy uh, that had collected around him a small collection with just a few dozen people. Most of them were a little sketchy. At least they were labor class, let's just put it that way. Some of them were more than you know, labor class, they were just sketchy. But there's this collection of individuals around him, and he was an unknown itinerant preacher, at least at that time, and, and assumed by actually most everybody, particularly those people in leadership, and of course the Romans and other people like that, just to be another cult leader. And if you look at history, in fact, if you look at history of that era, there was a bunch of guys before him and after him who were pretty much just cult leaders. In fact, when you look at our own history, just think about our own history in the US, Oh, in the last 20 plus years, um, in the few decades, just the guys that we've had that play out the same scene over and over again, charismatic figure, pit, preaches a bunch of stuff to a bunch of gullible people and kind of ends up wrecking their lives. I mean, think about David Koresh. Remember David? Now, some of you guys are too young to remember David Koresh. He was this guy, you know, long hair, kind of hip guy who gathered a bunch of people in Waco, Texas and ended up doing wackadoodle things that ended up bringing the government against him and a lot of people died and the whole thing fell apart, right? Or Jim Jones out of San Francisco. You might remember that guy. He ends up in Guyana and and talks people into killing themselves, like not just a couple, but a ton of them. How How do you do that? Or there's people that are maybe a little more familiar to us, at least here on Kauai, um, do you remember Amy Carlson? You might not remember her name, but their, their little group, this gal um, wanted to bring her group over to the North Shore. I think it was just two years ago. And they were, they were called Love is One group. And they were this little cult group that rented a house in Hanalei, right? Some of you guys remember that? And the whole neighborhood came out going, get out of here, bunch of crazy people. And they left and she actually died shortly thereafter. Um, but she, has a, she was a cult group, a real recent one. And even people you didn't hear about, but remarkably con people into believing, well, like this guy, you probably never heard this guy's name, Daniel Perez, he was, his movement was called Angels Landing, and he described himself as a, as a, hundred, a thousand year old angel. Okay, now, how gullible do you have to believe to buy that? Thousand year old angel, and he had this following of people, mostly gals who just moved with him around the country, and he, he would make his money by um, getting himself on the insurance policy of people who died. And as it turned out, he was killing the people who died, which is why he's in jail now forever. But these people have these cults. And so the idea that there was this guy and people looked at him as a cult leader shouldn't come as a surprise to us. 
especially because a lot of these cult, ra- cult leaders say really outrageous things. And you can see that most of these people go poof really quickly. And the people in, that, were the, that were the cultish kind of characters in the time of Christ, most of you don't even know their names. They just were just smudges in history, and that's it. But this itinerant pe- preacher started to say things that, well, were really outlandish. Maybe even more outlandish than your thousand-year-old angel. Especially to the people that he was saying it to. He made claims like this. I'm the creator God. The great I am of the Jewish faith. I'm the Messiah that's come. And he got himself in trouble, claiming he's the only means of salvation. At every turn, there were guys going, whoa, what is this? And some of the things that he, that he said were was cloaked. A lot of his teachings were cloaked. They were told in stories and parables and allegories that even his own followers were going, um, you're going to have to explain this one to us because I, I don't get it. And if I don't get it, they certainly don't get it. And on the banks of a lake in this little backwater town, he said one of the things that I find really, really fascinating and interesting when you really grasp what he was trying to say. It's very simple, but either the people who heard that either thought, this guy's nuts, or that he was either wildly optimistic or ridiculously optimistic. Just cra- crazy and that kind of thing. That If this is true, this is, this is the reach of optimism for a guy with your amount of people following you that nobody knows about in this massive Roman empire to say something like this. And here it is from Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. The words of Jesus, as you assume that's who I'm talking about. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It's the smallest of all the seeds. He's talking about the smallest of the gardening type seeds, not trying to make a botanical statement of all seeds. It's the smallest of the seeds, but it becomes the largest of the garden plants. It grows into like a tree. And birds come and make nests in its branches. Now, it's easy for us to say, okay, there's a mustard seed, um, and what does it turn into and stuff? Well, most, most of you were given, if you weren't, you were given a little package like this, and in it, there's some mustard seeds, okay? If you can't see these, they sort of look like, you know, one of those sprinklers that you put on your, on your cookies during Christmas, okay? It's about that size. That's a mustard seed, right? And it's, by the way, this is from the same variety that Jesus was talking about. This is the same kind of variety that was used in the Holy Land. I went to great expense to get this over here so you could see it, which is why you only get four of them. But try planting them in your garden. Um, Actually, I got a jar off Amazon, but shh. Um, But this is what he was talking about. And that's a pretty small seed, right? I spilled a bunch on my counter. I'm still finding them because it's a very small seed. And he's going, There's, this is a really small seed. But in the end, it's going to become something far more significant than what this is. And, and if you want to get a picture of what this looks like in full bloom, I think we have one, right, Lucas? There it is, OK? Now, it's, it doesn't look like a tree. It's not a tree like limbs and you know, stuff like that. But in a garden, that's a picking tree, you know? That's, that's more gnarly than the guinea grass around your house, OK? And he's going. This is, the kingdom of heaven is like this, but it's going to be like that. That's what's going to happen to it. Now, the word, the term kingdom of heaven is also used in the word, as in another term that's synonymous with it, the kingdom of God. Matthew tends to use um, the kingdom of heaven, and there's some reasons for that that I'm not going to get into this morning, rather than kingdom of God but they both mean the same thing. They both have the same meaning. And here's the important thing to understand, what what it means when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, because he uses that term 80 times in the New Testament, okay? And if if he uses that much, it must, must mean something, and we need to really get a clarity on what that means for us, what he's trying to communicate to us. And it means this, an experience, an event, or reign taking place in and through Christ, okay? 
Christ's own person or his mission. So it's, it's an experience that, that God is doing something, creating an event, creating a reign, creating an experience, but he's doing it through him or through his mission, something Jesus is directly involved in. So when he talks about the kingdom, it has kind of a broad specter to it, but it narrows down to go, it's something that God is trying to do in a human being, through a human being, or through the hands of a human being inspired by the whispers of the Holy Spirit that, that correlates with his mission and his desire and his will. Now spin forward in this journey to 80 years, because that's about the span of time from when Jesus gave this little simple teaching, comparing the kingdom to a mustard seed, to when Matthew picked up his pen and wrote it down in the book of Matthew. It's about 80, about 80, 80, um, about 80 years or so between those things. And when he wrote it down, the church at that time, there was, might have been 40 churches that we know of that we can count, 40 different churches. So if you add up all the Christians in the whole world, we're talking about a few thousand, all right? And yet he's writing this passage down about how the kingdom is gonna take off from this little thing and turn into this massive thing, but it doesn't look all that massive, at least at that point. But just wait, because by the year 300 AD, that kingdom had grown into millions of Christians scattered all around the entire Roman Empire, okay? Now we're talking that this little seed has turned into, well, frankly, just an itty bitty plant still because God's not done with his kingdom. God's not done transforming his mission, his will, his desire through his people to create what he, he is saying he's going to create. Ironically, over and over and over again, there'd be individuals who would sense, hey, there's something, there's something growing, there's a reign, there's a kingdom growing that is in contrast to my kingdom, the kingdom I want to set up, and we need to squish that. The Romans tried it a couple times, and every time anybody tried to squish that kingdom, what it did is it sent more seeds out and the kingdom got bigger and bigger. And sometimes it was uh, blockades put down by people that actually should have been leading the kingdom and, and seen it grow and thrive. They put things in the way of the kingdom and God raised up people who were true to his word, guys like Francis of Assisi and stuff, who began to live out the gospel when everybody else was just in it for the money or the power or the glory, and all of a sudden that kingdom just grew through these different places. If, God, if this guy doesn't want to be used by God, fine, he'll leave him alone and he'll go use this guy. And the kingdom it grew and grew and grew. It grew when they even tried to prevent people from getting their hands on a Bible so they could actually read the words of, of Christ in their own language. They go, no, 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 you need to be educated, you need to learn Greek or, or Latin in order to read the Bible. And a guy named William Tyndale quoted these words, which came true. He made his warning. By the way, he was burned at the stake for this warning, actually for doing what he warned, by translating the Bible into a filthy language called English. And Tyndale warned, he warned the guys who were pushing against the kingdom's growth and the expansion of the kingdom in these words, he said, if God spares my life ere many years, I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. And he's talking to these big lofty characters who are trying to stop it. And he did. And it turned out that it exploded, the scripture exploded, and the church exploded with it. When the communist revolution took over Russia, they closed virtually all the churches. They made them actually into museums of atheism, showing the old archaic things. Look at these old crosses people used to do. Look at this crazy cup they used to drink stuff out of there. Ah. And they everybody go in there and kind of laugh, laugh at, at uh, all of us who are Christians. But communism isn't around anymore. Those churches are open. 
fact, the gospel's sprouting up all over the place. And believe it or not, and I'm not calling, him that, calling out that, that he's a Christian, but Putin himself wears a cross around his neck, and he's agitating that the Constitution of Russia put Christian marriage, the traditional idea of Christian marriage, and the idea of God into the Constitution, make it a constitutional part of Russia. Okay? Hmm. You see what's happening here? Christian faith is growing and growing and growing. In fact, the Christian faith is now the largest faith in the entire world, and it's growing in places that you can't even imagine it because a lot of that growth is going on underground in places like China and places that you would never even imagine it. In fact, I just read a quote, uh, and it was uh, confirmed by a number of different sources, that in Iran, Islam is the fastest shrinking religion, Christianity is the fastest growing faith. Now, it's not because everybody in Iran's going, yeah, Christians, good, you know, let's support them, let's, let's open some more churches. It's all grew small groups of people meeting in homes all around. And it's growing and growing and growing. And when everybody tries to stop it, it grows, in, it grows even more. Which is, by the way, a lesson that some of these other, other governments ought to learn by. The Indian government ought to learn by this because the Indian government has decided to try to basically railroad everybody into Hinduism. And the way really they've done that is they've they decided to cut funding for groups like Compassion International, um, Mother Teresa's uh, Missionaries of Charity. They can no longer get funds outside of people from India. So that's why Compassion, there's no Compassion Kids in India because the check you write comes from America to support that kid. And the only way that you're allowed to support anything in India right now is if it's to a Hindu mission. You can get money out from outside to a Hindu mission. And the government in India ought to be careful about that because the minute you start to squish down what Jesus said was going to happen, try to get into the garden and start yanking things out, seeds go everywhere. And we see it over and over and over again played out because God, when Jesus made that statement, that outrageous, scandalous statement to a small group of people on the edge of a lake, he knew what he was talking about. He knew what was going to happen. And we get to be participants in that kingdom. Revelation says this, Revelation eleven fifteen, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. That's how it's gonna end up. But we're in that process right now. The reason I'm taking the detour on that to talk about all this history and where it's coming from is because in the end, God has chosen you and I, if you're a believer, to be the ones who carry his mission forth. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is our responsibility to carry forth. That's our mission in life. That's what we're designed to do. That very, very thing. The disease, the seed is designed to be planted in the heart of every believer. That's what it's designed to do, and it's designed to take root. But this seed only grows if it's tended. It, it, it's not just going to do it on its own. You have to take care of your spiritual life. And a lot of you know what that's, that we mean by that, and, and there's different ways to do that. Um, some of you get up every morning, you crack your Bible, and you have devotions. Some of you um, get stuff online. Um, some of you, you know, there's, there's Bible reading programs. Well, they'll read the Bible to you. You can listen to it on your radio on your way to work. Some of you take time and, and it just worship all the way to wherever you're going. You're going to go to Costco, you know, you give the kids... Uh, something to do in the back and you just turn on some worship music and you worship. But the, the message of God in our lives and our spiritual lives has to be tended. It has to be taken care of. It has to be fertilized. It has to be watered. It has to be, the, the junk in the way has to be removed. And that's an individual thing. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can make you closer to God. You have to draw that way yourself. It has to be something we desire, that I desire. So the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God in you and I has to be something that's tended. And the seed only becomes what it's designed to be if we let it take over completely 
That seed wants absolute dominance in your life. Now, a lot of us are like this. We're like, we're kind of, well, we like to take our lives and we like to put it in different kinds of segments, right? Um, we want to have our family pot, okay? We want to have our recreation pot, okay? We, we want to have our free time pot. We want to have it's my money, don't touch it pot. You know, we want to, I mean, I have a good friend who, who, and some of you heard me tell this story before, but I had a good friend who, when we were going down to, to water, we we're talking about how hard it is to surf like a Christian. And he goes, well, I just leave my Christianity right here at the water's edge. And the guy that was with me, and then we looked at him, we sort of stepped back and go, you first, sharks are waiting. Um, <laughs> but we oftentimes segment our life into all these different sections, and then we have our little, our little God pot, right? Our little Christian pot that, that we, okay, well, now, now I'm, I'm going to behave like a Christian, think like a Christian, but we've, we've separated our lives in all these different categories that are oftentimes divorced from the very thing that we ought to be invested in. And the, the fact of the matter is God wants to take control of all of those. He wants to run your workplace. He wants to run your family. He wants to run how you conduct your sporting life. He wants in, to conduct how you to conduct your finances. He wants every part of it. He wants absolute control. He wants to take over your life. That's the nature of this little seed. It wants absolute control. And of everything we have from our habits on down, if we don't give him control of that, we're going to actually end up hinder, hindering the kingdom. Because the seed, the seed doesn't really work if we hide it, if we compromise it, or we try to trim it back. And there are a lot of people that will say, well, dude, man, that... You're getting really fanatical now, right now. I don't want to be seen by everybody as a fanatic. I understand that. You don't have to wear a giant shirt that says, you know, I'm, I'm all about Jesus and prayed it around. You just have to live out that. You just live that out. And it doesn't mean you get in people's face and put your finger in their, in their nose and preach at them and stuff like that. But you live that out. You just let it ooze out of you because he's controlling every single area of your life so that if you're in construction, you're not only the best construction guy, but you're the most honest, okay? If you're a, repair, if you're a car mechanic, you know, you, you, you treat a car like it's your own. And I know you guys do, that's why I'm pointing at you. Good reputation, we've got a couple of car mechanics that got their reputations going all over the place, you know? Because they take their work and they, they put the kingdom work in it. How we conduct our affairs, how we speak to our spouse, how we raise our children, all those things coming under his control because that's what he desires. We don't try to trim it back. And, and the seed can't do its work, by the way, if it's grafted onto anything else. If we try to graft our politics, social justice, all that kind of stuff onto our faith, it, it just wrecks it, makes it weaker. Our own ideas, our own prejudices, those all things all have to be left aside and the faith has to be the central thing in our life. Now, it might influence all those things, but they can't be grafted on. It's not Jesus and politics. It's Jesus only. And he influences every area of our life. And by the way, in the end, the seed, it doesn't need you or I. It absolutely doesn't need you or I. This kingdom is gonna grow whether you wanna participate in it or not. This kingdom is gonna grow whether you're a Christian idiot or not, you know? This kingdom is gonna grow whether you've compromised your life or not. Whether, you, whether your Christian life is weak or strong, it's gonna grow. But the joy of it is when you find yourself being part of what God is trying to build. The joy of it is when he does live, live and work and speak through you into the lives of the other people and you begin to see the results of that. Yeah, I thought there's something different about you. I just found out you're a Christian. Now I know why you act that way. Instead of, oh, I heard you're a Christian. Why, how could you act that way? And that's what God has designed us to do, to live out our Christian life in such a way that other people 
see him become part of that kingdom. That's how the kingdom grows. It doesn't grow by us building bigger churches. It doesn't grow, grow by any of that kind of stuff because if you look in the book of Revelation, there's a whole bunch of churches listed. You can't find those guys now. But guess what? You can sure find a lot of Christians now because even those, those churches collapse for one reason or another. What God's agenda is, isn't going to. And either we jump on that train or we get left behind from it. And we're not talking about easy. The growth of the kingdom is not easy. There are people that are giving their lives for it right now. There are people that are sacrificing a ton of things for it right now. It is not easy. But that kingdom's growth is inevitable. It's going to happen. So I want to give Jesus the last word this morning as we just wrap up. This is from John 16, verse 33. This is him speaking to that group of little derelicts those questionable characters from questionable backgrounds in the backwater country, those guys who are going to have to take what he says and start telling it to people that go, oh, you're just another cult member, aren't you? You're just another fanatic. Yeah, we've seen you guys come and go. These are his words to those people. I've told you these things so that in me, not in the stuff that goes around, not how the world's going to react to you. Not because you've, you've accomplished something or haven't, but in me, you may have peace. In this world, on his mission, living his life through us, you're going to have trouble. It's not going to be easy. But... Take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you to live through us. We ask that you own every bit of our life, our attitude, our ideas, that you're seen in our employment. They're seen in our recreation. They're seen in our thoughts. They're seen in our words. That you might, your kingdom might be lived out through us, that the things that you said 2,000 years ago, we might be a part of extending your kingdom into the lost, into the people who are following false kings. They might come to know you. And we offer you, our lives, to do that very thing this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you. God bless you. Have a terrific, terrific Sunday. We'll see you guys this week.